Hey everyone, Ryan here. Welcome to this next series on patient management, an important topic that appears on the part two dental board exams. And it's tied for the most questions with 51 questions. So that being said, like all my videos, I'm gonna focus only on the highest yield things you need to know for the board exam. While I'm gearing these videos for exam preparation, they're also designed to give you a nice overview of these topics for clinical application and general knowledge. So the patient management section is very broad, ranging from how to actually manage patient behavior and expectations to infection control and evidence-based dentistry. So it's essentially the miscellaneous category of the exam. We're going to start this series with professional responsibility and liability for two reasons. Number one, there are a ton of ethics questions on the exam. In fact, most of the questions from this section will be on that. And the second reason is this topic to some degree guides a lot of the other things we'll get to later in the series. So it provides a nice framework. I apologize ahead of time, this topic is fairly dry, but I'll try to make it interesting. And all this information is from the ADA website. And it's truly a slog to read through, so I tried to pull out all of the most important points for you. So as dental professionals, we're given a position of authority granted to us by the public because of a commitment we made as professionals. Dentists are also self-regulated, which means we must adhere to a set of values called the principles of ethics. The ADA Code of Conduct is a written expression of how dentists are obligated to behave as part of this implied contract between the dental profession and society. So there are five principles of ethics that we'll cover, and then the code of conduct essentially applies those five principles in real life situations. So I would put this entire slide in red text if I could. If there's one thing you take away from this video, it's these five principles. So we have autonomy, which is self-governance, non-maleficence, which is do no harm, beneficence, which is do good, justice or fairness, and veracity or truthfulness. And so these five things are absolutely critical to remember, and we'll talk about them in more detail just now. So patient autonomy, let's start there. Dental professionals have a duty to respect the patient's right to self-determination and privacy or confidentiality. Professionals have the duty to treat the patient according to their desires, but within the bounds of accepted treatment. So under this first principle, the dentist is obligated to involve the patient in treatment decisions in a meaningful way, considering both their needs and their desires. So let's say a patient presents with a relatively healthy, healthy mouth, their teeth look fine, but they're not happy with the way they look, and they don't particularly like taking care of them. So they want all their teeth extracted, implants placed, and then an implant-supported denture both top and bottom. This is colloquially called teeth in a day. Now patient autonomy doesn't mean you automatically agree with this proposed treatment plan because you have training that the patient doesn't have and it's also your obligation to share your personal opinion. So I'd say something like, I'm sorry, but I can't agree with that treatment selection. And if you'd like, I can refer you to, I can refer you to another office for a second opinion, but I don't think it's in your best interest to, do te to have teeth in a day done for you. So professionals also have the duty to safeguard the patient's privacy, and this is according to the Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act, or HIPAA, their privacy rule establishes national standards to protect personal health information like patient name, address, phone number, etc. Let's talk about informed consent. So the dentist must share information with and obtain consent from the patient. And I've italicized these words, hence why it's called informed consent. So this is based on the ethical principle of patient autonomy, which we just talked about, because the patient has to choose to sign the consent form. 
Informed consent means you must inform the patient about the diagnosis, the nature of the procedure, the pros, cons, and alternative treatment options, including no treatment at all, and what would be the prognosis for all of these treatments. So you have to do this in a way that they understand, not using very technical lingo, but using terms that the patient can fully understand and comprehend. So informed consent doesn't need to include the physical cost of the treatment, and there's some debate about this, but fees are not part of an official informed consent. So if you don't have consent for a procedure, you can actually be held accountable for assault and battery. And before going through informed consent, make sure the patient can sign or has a parent or guardian who can. So we're going to talk a little bit more about this in the next slide. So in law, a minor is someone under a certain age, usually 18. 18 is the typical age of majority, at which point a person can give legal consent for a procedure. From age one to seven, they're considered by law an infant, not responsible for actions. Age eight to 14, they're considered competent, 15 to 17 responsible, and then once they hit 18, they're a major. They're no longer a minor. So minors younger than 18 can give implied consent, which is an informal agreement, or assent, which is the formal agreement of someone not able to give legal consent. But again, they can actually provide actual consent or informed consent. So again, it's very dry legal language, but it is important to know for the board exam. Now, of course, there's an exception to this. And emancipation of minors is a legal mechanism by which a minor can be declared independent from their parents or guardians. And the parents or guardians are then freed from any and all responsibility toward that child. So the exact mechanism of emancipation varies depending on state jurisdiction, but generally a conscious, mentally competent person under 18 can legally give consent, this is actual consent now, if they're married, a parent themselves, pregnant, a recipient of an educational diploma, serving in the military, or in emergency situations. Again, the exact rules for emancipation vary state to state, but at least be familiar with these factors and how you would consider a certain minor if these factors were not present. All right, next, also in the, in the vein of patient autonomy are the records for the patient. So original charts and x-rays must be kept by the dentist. This all goes back to, again, our first principle of patient autonomy and privacy, confidentiality of their records. So copies of charts and x-rays may be provided to the patient or an attorney, attorney with signed authorization by the patient. And a dentist should also get written consent to share patient info when consulting a specialist or other practitioners. The ADA recommends destroying records for inactive patients after seven years, but the test makers who write the board exam suggest to keep all documents for as long as possible. And that's because the truth is this exact number will vary state to state. In New Jersey, it's seven years. In North Carolina, it's 10 years. So it really is safest to just know as long as possible. So risk management. Risk management means you constantly weigh the risks and benefits of your practice. So risk management is all about being constantly aware of any liability, meaning you monitor risky activity and you stay away from dangerous activity. Documentation is the most essential component of risk management. So you have to, in all of your progress notes, include specific facts, be objective, so don't include criticisms of patient behavior, personal behavior quirks, things like that. Don't leave out important information, be complete, be timely, avoid gaps in time when writing notes, so try to do them on the date of service if possible. 
Never make or sign an entry for someone else. That's really important. Never delete or change anything you wrote. Instead, provide an addendum. And all writings are discoverable, so common sense, don't write anything you don't want to be read aloud in court. I'd also add to this, uh, avoid abbreviations within reason so everything is clear and understandable, because some abbreviations may not be understood by everybody. All right, so that's all for patient autonomy, and it's a really important concept, so all of those things are important to know. The second principle of ethics is non-maleficence. So primum non nocere, you may have heard of it, is a Latin phrase that means, first, do no harm. It's often accredited as part of the Hippocratic Oath, but that exact phrase is actually believed to not have appeared until quite a bit later. Now, dentists must keep their skills and knowledge up to date with continuing education, or CE, because as technology and medicine continue to advance, we must advance alongside it to continue to provide the standard of care. So for example, back in the early 1970s, there were no composites, enamel bonding, implants, bone grafts, and a lot of other things. So dentistry has come a long way in just a few decades. So it's a commitment to lifelong learning. And also do no harm by practicing within your limits in order to protect the patient. So a full bony impacted third molar, a difficult full mouth reconstruction case, molar endo, a complex orthodontic case, refer to a specialist, know your limits, and when to refer a case out. All right, the next principle is beneficence, to do good. Professionals have a duty to act for the benefit of others. So the dentist's primary obligation is service to the patient and the public at large. So this principle extends to community service, that we have an obligation to use our skills, knowledge, and experience for the improvement of the dental health of the public. And we're encouraged to be leaders in our respective communities. The most important aspect here is to promote the patient's welfare. So what that means is we practice preventive dentistry. We show them how to brush their teeth, how to floss, what to eat and not to eat, areas you're currently watching for potential cavities, and always do your best for the patient. The same ethical standard exists no matter the financial arrangement. So if they're managed care, fee-for-service, an in-house plan, it doesn't matter. Treat all patients the same. And this goes right with our next principle of ethics, or justice. So professionals have a duty to be fair in their dealings with patients, colleagues, and society. So under this principle, the dentist's primary obligations include dealing with people justly and delivering dental care without prejudice. Now, this doesn't mean you need to see everyone who walks in the door, because as we said before, Sometimes a case may be too difficult, and you should refer to a specialist or even another practitioner more experienced with a certain procedure to avoid doing harm to the patient. What this does mean is that that dentists cannot refuse to see patients or deny treatment because of their race, gender, creed, sexual orientation, gender identity, ethnicity, etc. We also have to be fair to our colleagues. So let's say a patient comes in and says their regular dentist did a filling and it already fell out and they're angry about it. Now patients should be informed of their present oral health status, but without disparaging comments about previous services, because at the end of the day, you don't know the circumstances under which the previous treatment was done. So we don't have the right to slander another dentist and we must never slander any dental professional. And our last principle of ethics is veracity. So professionals have a duty to be honest and trustworthy in their dealings with the public. So under this principle, the dentist's primary obligations include respecting the position of trust inherent in the dentist-patient relationship, communicating truthfully 
and without deception, and maintaining intellectual integrity. So what does that mean? That means dentists must not represent care being rendered, fees being charged, or any form of advertising in a false or misleading way. So let's say you told a patient, I need to remove all your amalgam restorations because they're toxic to your body. That's violating the principle of veracity. There's no clinical evidence to show that. You can't advertise that you do the brightest whitening treatment of any dentist. That's not true. You can't advertise that you're a specialist when you're actually a general dentist. All of this fits in the category of veracity and being truthful to the patient and the public at large. All right, so let's finish the video by talking about some miscellaneous legal terms. I know, so fun. So the statute of limitations is a set of laws that set a limit on the amount of time you have to go to court and get a medical malpractice case started. So the actual amount of time varies state to state, so don't worry about that. But generally, there are two basic rules that a state will follow. So the occurrence rule means that the statute of limitations starts to run after the injury or malpractice occurred. The discovery rule means that the statute of limitations starts to run after the injury or malpractice is discovered. So nice and easy to remember. Again, I've italicized these words because they inform the name of the rule. So for the occurrence rule, the clock starts ticking a bit earlier than for the discovery rule, which is a bit more lenient. All right, next let's talk a little bit about witnesses. So now we're in court. For an expert testimony, the plaintiff must produce an expert who has general or special expertise in dentistry and can testify to the existing standard of care and how it was breached by the defendant. So the standard of care I have underlined because it's an important legal term. It means the lowest acceptable level of care among members of the dentistry profession. So it's not the same as the gold standard. It's the minimum acceptable standard of care. So using rubber dams for root canals is an example of the standard of care. Now the other end of the spectrum here is the fact witness. So this is someone who was there at the procedure who has firsthand knowledge of the facts of the case. So they're usually subpoenaed or summoned to court and have to provide objective information about the treatment that was provided. All right, and last we have the Good Samaritan Act. So this law got its name from the parable of the Good Samaritan from Luke chapter 10 in the New Testament, where a traveler from the region of Samaria showed compassion and helped a man who had been attacked by robbers. So this law offers legal protection to health professionals and anyone who provides reasonable assistance to individuals who are injured in an accident, ill, in peril, or in danger in some way, or otherwise incapacitated. So this law is nice and easy to remember because these four conditions all start with the letter I. All right, and that's it for this video. Thank you so much for watching. If you're interested in supporting the channel, please check out my Patreon page. A huge thank you to Michael Raja, Ainz Lau, David Jaden, Yannet, and all of my patrons for their support. You can unlock extras like access to my video slides to take notes on and practice questions for the board exam. So go check that out. The link is in the description. Thanks again for watching, and I'll see you all in the next video.